For almost 30 years, the City Club of Eugene has been delivering our mission to build community vision through open inquiry by coordinating weekly programming on topical, engaging community issues. The City Club of Eugene creates the space for civil discussions about civic issues, and in so doing, we are among the most active and influential civic organizations in the state. We invite you to join us every week to hear directly from local, national, and international experts on current local events and to spend time in community together. Of course, we cannot do this work without your help. Support for the City Club of Eugene is provided by our members and both business and in-kind sponsors. Our diamond sponsors are Kaiser Permanente, the University of Oregon, Peace Health, and Lane Community College. And we appreciate the support of the City of Eugene and Lane County. Whether you're a first time or a long time listener, I'm asking you to consider supporting our work by becoming a member at cityclubofeugene.org. And lastly, whether you're in the room with us or watching online, we encourage you to ask questions of our speakers during the Q&A session that will immediately follow their presentations. Speaking of those presentations, how do these questions sound for you? Why do some neurons grow up to manage burn injuries and others manage toes? Why is the disappearance of murder or murder of some people reported much less accurately than others? Are there strategies for negotiating land use decisions that give appropriate weight to legitimate competing interests? Those are some of the questions that piqued the curiosity of three undergraduate researchers at the University of Oregon's Center for Undergraduate Research and Engagement. Working with senior scholars on the faculty, the students delved into the data and immersed themselves in the social and political factors that affect our world. These scholars are proof that at great universities, including UO, students don't just absorb ready-made knowledge, they help make it. Tyler Ramos is majoring in human physiology and minoring in chemistry and creative writing. It's quite a trifecta. In the research lab of Professor Chris Doe, Tyler studies neuronal development in the optic lobe of the fruit fly. The goal of his project, the role of proteins in neuron development, is to uncover the mechanisms that cause neurons to develop with distinct characteristics. Feruza Lagas is a first generation college student with a passion for advocacy. She aims to be a voice for those who do not have the resources and ability to advocate for themselves. Her research project is The Unseen Numbers, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Black Women. Jess Gladys has always been fascinated by how glaciers have shaped diverse human relationships with landscapes and places over time, and how in turn these relationships adapt in response to land use and climate change. Her research project is an axiological approach to collaborative ecosystem stewardship in the Nisqually watershed near the Puget Sound in Washington. I don't know about you, but I feel smarter already. So please join me in welcoming our panelists to the City Club of Eugene. Tyler, you're first. Can you hear me okay? Great, great, all right. Well, uh, hello everyone. As was mentioned, my name is Tyler Ramos and um, I'm really excited and happy to be here with you all today. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to talk a little bit about my research. So there's some big words up on this screen right now. Um, this is the title of my project that I've been working on and its title is A Homeo Domain Protein Generates Neuronal Diversity. And we're gonna unpack what all that means in just a moment. So what I'd like to start with is um, by showing you this artistic rendering of the human brain. Um, what we're looking at here are uh, different nerve fibers and all the different colors represent the different types of neurons that exist within our brain. And as you can see, it's pretty diverse. We have quite a few neurons that allow us to do everything we do. I'm standing up here speaking to you because the complexity of our brain is what allows me to do so. And one of the fundamental questions of developmental neuroscience is how do we go um, from one cell to thousands, millions of different neurons. And uh, to study this in humans is really difficult, as you can imagine, we're pretty complex um, and there's some ethical considerations to take into account. Um, but what I can show you side by side here is the brain of the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. And although on a much smaller scale, 
Um, what I hope you can appreciate is it too has a very diverse collection of neuron types. And arguably, flies can do things we can't. They can fly. We cannot fly without planes, of course. Um, but it is really this diversity, this complexity, um, that allows flies to do um, all, that they, all that they do. Um, and when it comes to why fruit flies are important here, um, is that they are much easier to work with. And we have decades of research that has shown uh, that many of the basic biological mechanisms of how neurons uh, develop in fruit flies are actually held true in mammals, which includes humans. So really, fruit flies are the ideal model organism with which to study um, how we get the complex brains that we do. So what I'd like to start with is just by sharing what we know so far um, about how we get this complexity, specifically in the fruit fly. And this has been shown to be true in mammals as well. So what we know is that an organism starts, oh, hopefully you can see this in the corner, an organism starts with a pool of what's called progenitor cells. These are stem cells that have yet to become anything, um, and they receive some sort of temporary signal from the organism. And in turn, this establishes what we call the fate of the neuron. This identifies what the neuron's going to become. Um, the press release mentioned why do some neurons uh, manage burns, whereas others manage toes. This is sort of the step that will determine whether it manages toes or manages burns. And then from here, um, the signal allows the neurons to make all the connections they do within our body. Um, but the very fact that the signal in the progenitor is temporary means that there has to be other factors, other signals, that are initiated in the neuron and then persist through the life of the neuron to help maintain its identity and its connections. And so um, my mentor and I, we hypothesize that a certain class of proteins called homeodomain proteins, and I'll just, I'm just going to say HD proteins from now on, um, we believe that these could be the proteins that sort of bridge this gap here and persist in the neuron to um, allow our neurons to perform the functions they do for their whole life. So let's talk a little bit about fruit fly brain. For folks listening on the radio, I apologize, this might be a little bit difficult to imagine if you've never seen a fruit fly brain before, but it's about the size of uh, maybe two uh, grains of jasmine rice stuck together, so it's quite small. Um, but this is as if we're looking at the fly head on, and its uh, back is on top and its stomach is on the bottom. And I studied the optic lobe, which is equivalent to our eye, um, and specifically the outer region, and this is called the lamina. We have a lamina as well. It's not called a lamina. It's called a, a region of bipolar cells. But everything that I'm talking about here pretty much has homology or orthologs in mammals, um, which is why uh, we can extrapolate what we learn from here to, uh, to humans, and as well as things like mice. So let's imagine that we take the brain, and we look at it from top-down view now. And then we're just going to zoom in on the region that I look at. And this here is the lamina. And the lamina is really simple, thankfully. Um, there's only five different neuron types. We call them L1 through L5, and they're pretty well characterized in the literature. Um, I'm showing them separated here, but in reality, the circles at the top, those are the cell bodies, they arrange in layers that look a little bit something like this. And what you can see in the circled red area is what we call the L4 and L5 neurons, and this is what I focus on in my research. And the reason why I focus on these two is because it's been found that they express a combination of these HD proteins that I was talking about before. The names of those in L4 are BSH and Aptris, and in L5 it's BSH and PDM3. The names don't matter a whole lot, as long as it's understood that these are simply proteins of interest that uh, I think might uh, basically answer my hypothesis. So when we discovered that um, L4 and L5 express these proteins, what we wanted to do was uh, understand when they begin their expression in the organism to maybe reveal how they're working in relationship with one another. And so what I'm showing you here is um, to the left, the green circles are those progenitor cells I was mentioning. The blue is neurons that are a little bit older and the magenta is the BSH protein. And what I hope you can appreciate here um, is that at the beginning in the progenitors, you can see that BSH uh, actually starts its expression quite early and then it's maintained throughout the life of L4, which is on the top, and L5, which is on the bottom. On the other hand, the two other proteins I mentioned, Aptris and PDM3, their expression begins later in the life of the neuron, and you can see that uh, at the far right there. On the top is the L4, that magenta color, and then on the bottom is the blue L5. And so to kind of summarize this in a cartoon fashion, basically what we're saying is that BSH starts first as a protein, and then Aptris and PDM3 come about. And the reason why this is important is because 
it reveals kind of a sequential expression pattern. And that kind of indicates to us that um, BSH could be regulating when these two other proteins are first being expressed. And so to see if that's true, we use some really fancy genetic tools to where we can actually get rid of the protein in the organism, and that's specifically BSH we can get rid of. And that's what we did. So in the green circles here, that's the BSH protein, and we do this thing called a knockdown, and you can see that the green, the BSH, is no longer there. So once we can knock out this protein, we can see what changes have been made in the organism and maybe make some conclusions from that. And what we were uh, able to see was that in addition, when we knocked down BSH, we saw from top to bottom here that the other proteins after Sympedium 3 were also gone. And the reason why this is important is because uh, both of these proteins are what give L4 and L5 um, their identity, basically. So by getting rid of them as a result of knocking down BSH, um, we basically got rid of the L4, L5 neurons. And so what we were able to conclude is that this BSH protein is required for these two neurons to be born. So from here, um, what we actually found was that although L4 and L5 are gone, um, there's still actually neurons in those layers. Um, and the reason why that's important is because uh, we, uh, getting rid of L4 or L5 doesn't mean that um, they necessarily died, but we wondered if other neurons could sort of have taken their place. And indeed, that's actually what we see. So what I'm showing you now, same idea, except in the magenta is the L1 neuron, just another neuron in the lamina, and the green is the L3 neuron, also another neuron in the lamina. And when we knock down BSH, we no longer have L4 or L5, but you see at the bottom there in that white selected region that the L1s and L3s actually pop out instead of L4 and L5. So what we're saying here is that um, upon getting rid of the BSH protein, we get rid of two neuron types, L4 and L5, and instead, other lamina neurons pop out in, um, at the expense of those two. And so I'll just summarize basically everything here uh, in cartoon form. Um, so in control, when BSH is present in a lamina precursor, it specifies two neurons, L4, L5. And so altogether, we have five different neurons in the lamina. And in this control fly, the fly can do all of its functions that it normally needs to. But when we remove BSH, we see that we actually get uh, only three neuron types. We call them L1 through L3. And so what we're able to conclude from this is that just this single protein, BSH, is generating the diversity of these neurons in this uh, region of the organism. And so um, essentially, uh, our next steps are kind of uncovering um, how BSH does this, um, the pathways with Aptris and PDM3, and to see if this uh, pathway, I guess you could say, holds true in mammals, uh, maybe even humans one day, um, if we get there. But the whole idea here is that um, BSH is that HD protein I was talking about in the beginning that persists in the life of a neuron to help maintain its identity and its characteristics. And so overall, um, uh, we were able to basically answer the hypothesis or at least get one step closer in our question of how do we get the complex brains that we do? Well, we're one step closer to answering that. We know that some proteins, simply by existing through the life of a neuron, allow us to have the complex brains that we do. Uh, lastly, I'd just like to give some acknowledgments to uh, my mentor, Chun Di Zhu, who's an amazing mentor, as well as the lab PI, Dr. Chris Do. I feel really grateful to be um, part of such a supportive team uh, of individuals who um, just support me in everything that I do in the lab and outside of the lab. Um, I hope you learned something about flies. I hope before now, if you see a fly in your kitchen, before you smack it and kill it, hopefully you can say, okay, you know, I, I see why you're here. Uh, you serve a role besides just eating my fruit. Uh, thank you all so much. I, I really appreciate it. And then if I may uh, introduce Feruza Lagasse. Right, hello everybody. Um, to again introduce myself, my name is Fruza Lagas. Uh, again, senior at the U of O. I'm from Sacramento, California, and I'm majoring in women and gender studies. Um, 
my research project is titled The Unseen Numbers, um, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Black Women in the US. Um, and the question I wanted answered when I first embarked on this journey was, why did these two groups of women go missing or murdered at alarmingly higher rates and in comparison to white women get little to no media attention? Um, and let's go to the next one. Um, my methodology relied heavily in media because um, this is how it kind of started. Um, and media being a powerful tool, and when that was a point of comparison for me, um, whether it be through social media, movies, books, music, I looked for the support through these outlets to find my answers. Um, and I did various different data collections through my own social media outlets, um, such as the ones that you see on the screen right now. And another exercise I did, which I will conduct with you all in the room, is by, um, I'll ask you to raise your hands if you recognize the following names that I call out. Um, the first one is Victoria Shaw, age 15. The second one is Arielle Munchinson, age 16. The third one is Beatrice Adam, age 36. Um, the fourth one is Amanda Simpson, age four. And the last one is Gabby Petito, age 22. So recognizing that last name um, is a major reason um, that pushed me into this research project this past summer. Um, within the fall of 21, um, Gabby Petito went missing, and this case was so heavily in all um, sources of media, and especially within our age group um, on campus, whether it be through TikTok, Instagram, this was such a big case that we, it seemed like we couldn't escape. Um, and I couldn't help but think about all the other people whose missing posts circulate on the internet and don't ever get this much traction. Um, and alongside black and indigenous women, of course, there are many other individuals of color and identities that also go missing and have their lives neglected as well, which is very important to highlight. But with this, these two groups specifically I chose because of my own identity of being a black woman and um, my historical knowledge of how black women and na native women are tied together. Um, so a couple of different points of national data. Um, according to the nativewomenswilderness.org, um, more than four out of five indigenous women have experienced violence, which is 84% of the entire native population. The National Institute of Justice report includes the murder rate of indigenous women is three times higher than Anglo-American women. The FBI's National Crime Information Center database includes in 2021, over half a million people were reported missing in 2021, and more than 30, more than 350,000 were children. And of that number, 70,000 were black girls. Um, now, this is a lot of information. It's a lot of data that I kind of had to analyze and synthesize and group into history and relevance and how it's seen today, and more importantly, what to do with that information, because um, I think that's the whole point of why I even embarked on that journey. Um, but it meant understanding his history through an intersectional point of view. Um, and for those of you who don't know what the definition of intersectionality is, it's a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw and other black feminist theories that describe how race, gender, sexuality, religion, citizenship status, class status, et cetera, all contribute to an individual's current positioning in life. Um, understanding different ideas of what um, feminism is and activism is as well. Um, an example of, um, example of that is Chicana feminism, which also identified the basics of intersectionality prior to Kimberly Crenshaw um, adding or giving it a specific name. Um, and it also grouped in um, the idea of what, of citizenship, which is a big, big deal within this whole um, uh, idea as well. 
Um, in this case, black and indigenous women have their race and their gender that will predispose them to violence or treatment simply because of their status, which also shifts again if their class status is included, if their sexuality is included, and religion as well. Um, again, understanding colonialism's roots um, and how that plays a part um, in understanding capitalism, which you know, requires the selling of labor for capital, which is the very, and in this case, um, the very first form of labor in this nation was from enslaved people, which ties in the, um, the direct way that black women specifically are impacted um, and their relevance and their worthiness of their body that's put onto them. Um, from this foundation, we are able to understand the value placed on bodies that produce labor versus bodies that don't produce labor um, and bodies being assigned a level of worth based off of their intersecting identities. Um, understanding how we can see the physical bodies of black and indigenous women being neglected through the way that um, one of my sources identified um, Christy Dotson in On the Way to Decoloni Decolonization in the Settler Colony, reintroducing black feminist identity politics. Um, she describes a triad of settler, native, and slave. Um, this is supported by the logic of el elimination which requires elimination of a group, the colonial power which is to excavate, and then the labor required to build it which is needed. Indigenous people being the group to take from, and then the enslaved people, black people, rebuilding. Um, and this triad kind of linking the two groups and showcasing that you cannot address one without the other. Um, and like I said, this project is something that is still going and it's so big and so personal that you know, it can't really be um, one finished, and it's <laughs> it's a continued process. I've turned it into a thesis that I'm still working on, um, and but from all of this, I've gathered about three sentences that I will leave you with, um, and it's through the long-standing, deep-rooted effects of colonialism, patriarchy, and capitalism, Black and indigenous women go missing and murdered within the United States at alarmingly high rates with little to no attention in comparison to white women. And this is a neglected process because addressing this neglect of these lives would mean facing the current system of capitalism and effects of colonialism that we continue to support and participate in, either willfully or unwillfully. Thank you. And up next, I would like to present Jess Gladys. Move this back up. I'm a little taller than that. Um, Okay, can you hear me okay? All right, thank you so, so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here once again, um, and to Feruza and Tyler for amazing presentations and work that you're doing. Um, once again, my name is Jess Gladys. I'm a senior undergraduate researcher at the University of Oregon studying environmental studies and philosophy. And today I'm gonna be talking to you about my research, um, which is looking into an axiological approach to collaborative watershed stewardship. And for this, I am using the IPES and hermeneutic phenomenology to understand conflict resolution and collaboration processes over highly valued resources. Now, I know those are a lot of big words I just threw at you, so I'm gonna spend the first part of this presentation just kind of unpacking those terms and how they're used here in the context of my research. And then I'll explain my research questions, my method, and conclude with some insights I've gleaned from this approach. So, First of all, what the heck is hermeneutic phenomenology? Um, so phenomenology is essentially, it's a long-standing philosophical tradition, but it's the description of phenomena as known through lived experience. So it's studying meaning and experiences and investigating this, like, uh, this big theme in philosophy of the relation between subject and object. Hermeneutics is the interpretation of phenomena, um, and it's based on how value-laden experience is articulated. So it takes how we're studying meaning and experience and looking at how it's expressed through language. 
Uh, hermeneutics has many methods and traditions, but it's all about understanding meaning from the context from which it is given. Um, and that's what informs its use in my method in narrative analysis, which I'll go into later. Um, and so yeah, I use this philosophical lens and I apply it to documents on watershed stewardship in my case study. All right, next is EPAS. So EPAS stands for the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Uh, that's a mouthful though, so we call it EPAS. Um, and so as seen on the graphic that's on the screen, EPAS identifies four elements of values that are manifest in biodiversity and ecosystem services, um, planning assessments and reports and things like that. Um, and those four things are worldviews, broad values, specific values, and indicators. So my work, due to its scope, um, is primarily seeking out the presence of three types of these specific values, is what they're called, and those are relational, intrinsic, or instrumental. And I'm looking at those within planning documents and taking inventory of biophysical, economic, sociocultural indicators and the stakeholder voices that present themselves in the process. So I have relational bolded here on the screen because there is a call for an inclusion of more relational value types in ecological decision making as much of the pre-existing ecosystem services paradigm in Western culture is really focused on these like instrumental market, um, very ends based logics, if that makes sense. Um, and so while <laughs> giving you the full definitions and the applications of those concepts would take away time from the rest of my work, my presentation, what I really want you to walk away with understanding is that what EPES is doing is important because it's institutionally creating um, an international forum, not only for biodiversity, but cultural diversity as well. Um, so that's huge. And in line with EPES's proposed frameworks, I'm conducting evaluation of environmental conflict resolution and collaborative watershed management in a well-documented case study using an approach of hermeneutic phenomenology and a method of narrative analysis. And so because of EPES, I'm identifying and coding for the quantity and quality of specific values in planning documents. And so where am I applying this? Um, as you can see, it's very beautiful, the Nisqually River watershed in Puget Sound, Washington. And so on the screen, I have a map of the watershed and a photo from, I believe, the mid watershed region. And the Nisqually River watershed covers 720 square miles in the Puget Sound region. Um, and it originates at the Nisqually Glacier at the summit of Mount Rainier National Park. And it courses into the valley until it terminates in the estuary, which flows into the Nisqually Delta in Puget Sound. Um, it spans the occupied homelands of the Nisqually, Yakima, Puyallup, Muckleshoot, and Upper Collets people. And the Nisqually 78 mile course provides habitat for several types of salmon, including threatened species and then waterfowl, tons of flora and marine life like shellfish. It is not only the only river to have its headwaters in a national park and Delta in a national wildlife refuge, but it is also Southern Puget Sound's single largest freshwater source, according to the Washington Department of Ecology. So you can see it's pretty important. Um, because of this, it is also among the most pristine and protected watersheds in Western Washington. The watershed and its river council is now a leader and model of sustainable, inclusive stewardship practices. And its modern reputation for collaboration was the result of generations of advocacy and litigation for treaty rights by the Nisqually Indian tribe and other Western Washington tribes. So my research is taking this really unique context into account when examining the relationship between values and the efficacy of watershed planning processes. So on to my research. Um, bear with me here, because what you're about to see on the screen is the amalgamation of years of looking into these questions. And these are the, the three final questions I've been able to nail down as I'm writing my thesis. So I have a theoretical question, a practical question, and this big picture question. And so theoretically, I'm just trying to figure out what new insights can possibly be gained from analyzing this case study using this axiological value-based framework um, that's based in hermeneutic phenomenology and the EPES values assessments. Practically, I'm wondering how does specific values by varying watershed um, stakeholders change and or correspond with differing relational experiences of an ecosystem and its resource contributions. And practically, what does this mean for, what do these theoretical insights mean for conservation policy and planning outcomes? So to answer this, I've combined qualitative approaches given by hermeneutic phenomenology and the EPES framework to interpret specific values evoked by various stakeholders within these documents. So these methodological frameworks will enlighten the plurality of values that are present in collaborative decision-making processes, which furthers our understanding of precisely what and how values underpin decision-making processes. 
So aligned with pre-existing literature and studies on value pluralism and ecosystem management, this methodology supports that a diversity of values in planning leads to more egalitarian, democratic, and just planning outcomes. And so, really quickly, I've touched on it a lot, but I'll just go into the specifics of my method. And so, I'm conducting a hermeneutic narrative analysis, and I'm reviewing over 30 policy and planning documents from local, regional, state, and federal stakeholders um, and watershed stewards. Um, section by section, line by line, <laughs> I am coding for specific value indicators, so either, again, the relational, instrumental, or intrinsic um, values that are embedded throughout the plans. And while I'm doing that, I'm also taking note of what interests are expressing what values to see if there's correlation between identity and value expression. This is ultimately in service of this phenomenological interpretation of people's connections to the watershed and its resources based on their articulated values about nature's contributions to people. And so, finally, some insights that I've been able to glean so far in this study is that one of the most disempowered stakeholder groups in the watershed became among the most empowered voices following the institutional and statement of their resource rights. This is seen um, in the mid 20th century with the Bolt decision of 1974, watershed management acts um, within the later 20th century. Uh, I, in line with EPES, I have also found that value pluralism, this diversity of values that are present in these planning processes lead to better planning outcomes. And there is also diverse representation of values in a squally watershed, which has perhaps influenced its relative success. And so I'm kind of proposing or predicting that this cooperation and resilience that this community models and demonstrates is better equipped, uh, makes it better equipped to cope with the unprecedented challenges of climate change and glacier melt and all of that unexpected fun stuff of the 21st century that we're dealing with today. Um, and just up there on the graph is an example of some of the quantitative elements of what I'm doing, but by no means does that capture <laughs> everything that's going on here. Um, so yeah, that's the basics of my research, and I just wanted to finish it out with um, quick acknowledgments. I just want to especially shout out um, Dr. Mark Carey in the Glacier Lab, Dr. Michael Moffitt, and Dr. Barbara Maraca for their endless support <laughs> throughout all of this and dealing with all my curiosity, and also the stewards of the Nisqually Watershed for giving me that context, and thank you all for having me. so much. We will begin our Q&A uh, in just a moment, but first I'd like to thank the business and in-kind sponsors whose support helps to make City Club possible. Thank you to our Sapphire sponsor, Summit Bank. Founded in 2004, Summit Bank is the only independent community bank headquartered in Eugene. Summit Bank is Oregon's business bank, and Summit's mission is to be the best community bank for businesses and professionals. You can learn more at sbko.bank. Thank you to today's gold sponsors, Headshots Eugene and Hummingbird Wholesale. And thank you to our in-kind sponsors, KRVM 91.9 Radio, Pack Info and Simplified Computing LLC, and Dot Dotson's Photography. Also a special thank you to our award-winning public radio station KLCC FM, that's 89.7, for airing City Club programs Mondays at 7 p.m. For those listening at home right now, your household is one of several thousand tuning into City Club on KLCC. We love that you are here. And we also know some of you are listening on Interstate 5. Some of our panelists thought maybe you wouldn't like their voices, but you, you should tell them that you do. You can also find all recent City Club programs archived on KLCC, as well as on our YouTube channel and as podcasts. We'll take just a brief break before returning for questions and answers. Thank you.
Welcome back to the City Club of Eugene and our program with Tyler Ramos, Feruza Lagasse, and Jess Gladys. There are UO undergraduate researchers that we're uh, pleased to have here today. Uh, everybody uh, is welcome to come to the microphone and state their name and ask a question. Roz, you're first. Okay. I'm Roz Stein. I've been a member for quite a while. You know, I, I don't, I'm just in awe of the three of you. <laughs> and I, it, it, it gives me great hope for the future that uh, we have people like you. It's wonderful. So um, I didn't understand a lot of what you were saying, but it, sound, <laughs> but it sounded good. I mean, you know, it's so, um, and you're very engaged and you care. And I, I'm sure you're gonna go on with your education. Um, but I was kind of wondering, um, being in education myself, could each one of you kind of tell me um, your background before you got to the U of O? You know, what was it like and where were you from and just, just how you got so well educated and so well spoken? <laughs> and, and thank you for being here. Am I getting started? Okay, I can start with that. Um, a little, a little further, further back, way back. Uh, my family and I were actually from Ethiopia. So, me and my parents came to San Jose, California, when I was about one years old, and um, you know, grew up in California most of my life. And my parents, my parents weren't as um, fortunate or as privileged to get higher education or education in general. So they always put an emphasis on education. My education was never something to, you know, play around about. It was, it was my priority, um, still up until now. And so any sort of educational um, activity I got into, it's, I, I did it um, thinking that, you know, it's gonna turn into something bigger. I, I was always dedicated in that. Um, and so that, I, I guess that answers half of it. Um, and into into like the researcher role, um, I got into this amazing program called Ducks Rise, which is about a year or two years old at the U of O, and that was what initially um, gave me the idea that I could even you know go the social science route and um, do research uh, because I was very passionate about that. And they were the ones that provided me with the funding to do that this past summer. And um, along with my own, I, I like to read. I like to um, be involved in a lot of these social um, issues. Um, granted, my own identities are most likely always on the line as well. So it's kind of hard to not pay attention and it's kind of hard not to um, do something about it. Especially being young, you kind of have to figure out how you can be involved in what aspects you can um, you know, impact the best way. Um, and in my case, it was through my education and it was through bringing attention to these issues. Um, so yeah. Oh, name again. Um, <laughs> so my name is Jess. That was Feruza who just okay. gave that very eloquent answer. And thank you for that great question. Um, so first half of the question, I'm from the Chicagoland area, as Mary <laughs> will <laughs> point out. Um, so yeah, I'm just from south of Chicago. And growing up, I wasn't like, I didn't have like a great school district or any of like these amazing opportunities. College was not a, a guarantee for me. It was something that I just like really hoped and aspired for and worked hard to get into the UO. And um, now I'm here and so very grateful. I'm in the Clark Honors College as well. So that was where I was able to kind of get that entry into, into research um, and meet all of these amazing people. Dr. Mark Carey, Dr. Barbara Maraca. I was in two of her philosophy classes in one term and I would just go to her office hours <laughs> every time there was availability and she's like, you sound like you're interested in, in these concepts. <laughs> I was like, yeah, a little bit. Um, <laughs> and so then I got a grant from the Mellon Foundation on ice and environmental justice and started asking these questions like, why do people care about glaciers? And so I started looking into glaciated watersheds and um, found it such like an integral part of people's identities, which was so interesting to me because being from where I'm from, our landscape, the Great Lakes, it's, it's formed by glaciers, but I don't, I don't ever see glaciers. I'd never seen a glacier before I went out and did field work, so, but I still cared so much about them and climate change, and that kind of ties into um, 
the, the interest that I had in climate change and stewardship and things like that from a young age and just thinking about those questions and also coming from like a grassroots organizing, like very political oriented background. Um, I just kind of wondered how does, how does political clout like happen from a grassroots, from a grassroots perspective. Um, and then I looked at like the, the Squally Indian tribe and I just think the case study is really inspiring. So that's where like theoretically I, was, I started thinking about these concepts and found a case study that was just kind of like the bread to my butter, <laughs> so. Um, my name is Tyler Ramos, once again. Um, in terms of background, I grew up in Pueblo, Colorado. Um, I come from a very large family, uh, half of whom is from Mexico, and the other half um, is of uh, Spanish descent. And um, they, they, they're a loving family. They are wonderful. Um, and the thing is, though, about Pueblo, and this is not a dig on where I grew up on necessarily, but um, it's one of those places where you have a tendency to get stuck. And so I had actually the great pleasure of growing up with my great-grandparents uh, and my grandparents and all of their siblings as well. Um, but they've all been there for a very long time. And uh, so my parents in particular um, were very, um, they wanted to ensure that I had the opportunity to get out of Pueblo. And that's exactly what I did. <laughs> um, but that isn't to say that I'm not grateful for um, the um, support that I've gotten from my family and all that they've set me up with. Um, but needless to say, um, I'm one of the first to uh, go to college in my family, which is an uh, amazing blessing to be able to do. Um, and uh, for a long time, I wanted to be a doctor. And uh, so that's what I kind of came into college thinking. Um, and that still is the case, a medical doctor in particular. But uh, there came a point um, about two and a half years ago where um, I uh, needed a job. And so I looked just for, for almost any job. And uh, uh, interestingly, um, there was a neuroscience a research assistant in a neuroscience lab. And uh, I, had no I knew nothing about neuroscience at the time, to be quite honest, and uh, nor did I, um, frankly, have a ton of interest. Um, but I knew that I needed to make some money. So <laughs> I, uh, I, I joined uh, Dr. Christo's lab, and it became a really fruitful and just amazing experience because um, I was introduced to developmental neuroscience and uh, realized that flies do serve a purpose mm -hmm. besides eating our fruit. Um, but uh, yeah, needless to say, it's been a really wonderful journey and experience. And um, along the way, um, back when I was in high school, um, I was introduced to uh, uh, literature, generally speaking, but poetry became something really important to me. And so that's why I've uh, chosen to um, pursue creative writing as a minor. And so uh, what, I, what I try and do, if I can, is find a way to um, bridge what I learn in, in lab and in science with um, how to articulate that in um, a, a way that um, speaks to the human experience uh, through poetry. So, um, yeah, uh, that's where I'm from and, and what I do. Yeah. Thank you for those answers. Uh, my name is Marty Ravitz. I've been a City Club member for many years, and your background stories are so inspiring. I'm really glad that Roz asked that question. Um, I wanted to ask a more particular, specific question of Ms. Lagasse about your research on indigenous and black women whose stories are not amplified mm -hmm. in the media as mm -hmm. they should be. Um, I don't follow social media, but rather I hear about these cases when they do um, surface in the media on television, in the newspapers, more traditional mm -hmm. media outlets. And I wonder uh, if you are able to gather any quantitative information about how um, indigenous and black women are treated, and also if you have any uh, information or if you're gathering information from more traditional media sources. Um, thank you for that question. And yes, that was my um, original intent was going out and finding, you know, um, data within um, police reports, within county reports, and um, I do, 
that that's something that I did fail to add into my presentation, so I apologize about that. But I wanted to highlight that the times in which we're living in now, um, social media, or when I when I pointed out the Gabby Petito case, it was the way that urgency and consistency was what brought the outcome that it did um, and the attention that it did um, nationally, even globally. I would you know, scroll through and I would see people who were in Germany and all of these people who were so invested and it was, I, I specifically chose to go through the social media route because of that, because I wanted to study you know, the trends of or why we even allow trends of missing cases, uh, missing case reports to kind of go up and down and the fluctuating of that. Um, and because media in general, social media is just so, something that is more understood, I would say, within um, our generation. Um, and I apologize for that, <laughs> but, but it's something that I feel like it, it's something that uh, people can turn into um, a communication tool and a very powerful communication tool in any aspect that they want to. And so I guess targeting it through that is why I chose I chose it. So, but I, I did I did try to gather as much um, data in the traditional sense. It just um, analyzing it through social media and gathering um, data through social media is what I wanted to emphasize. Hi, um, I'm Kitty Piercy, and uh, once upon a time I was mayor of Eugene, and so I just want to tell you, um, for all, I think all of us, we're so glad you're part of our community. Uh, it makes our community a better place to have you coming from all different places to be part of us for part of your life. Mm -hmm. So we're really, really glad to have you here. And um, I guess I, part of my question has already been answered, but what I'd really like to hear from you is you're doing this wonderful research, you're having this great academic experience. Mm, where do you hope to be in 10 years? <laughs> oh, you want me to go first? Okay. You want to go first? <laughs> no? Okay, I will go first. That's a great question. Um, so 10 years specifically, I I'll, I'll guess I'll answer that. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I guess as I mentioned, um, my, I've always, always, I've wanted to be a doctor for a couple years now. Um, going into college, that was my goal. Um, and that, that still is my goal. I think my research has helped me kind of uh, shape that into a medical doctor who uh, can also do research or may also do research. Um, what I was exposed to was that uh, doctors are absolutely vital. They're the folks that you know are out there and, and performing the uh, the things that we need. Um, and then on the other hand, there's folks that are in the lab who are studying the pathways, studying the body, and reporting on um, what doctors can do and should do, perhaps um, to better um <coughs> uh, to better you know our, us to better ourselves. Um, so my hope and my goal is this year um, I'll graduate and then uh, take about a year off to study for. Um, my medical school entry exams, and uh, uh, hopefully gain some work experience, some life experience, and um, I'd like to uh, become a medical doctor. Um, what kind? I'm, I'm still working through that. I am particularly interested in preventative care, and that lead, lends itself to pediatrics pretty well, I think, and I love children, and so I could absolutely see myself working with kids in the future um, in a primary care setting, just ensuring that um, from a young age, uh, what what is needed is is provided, um, and hopefully to uh, create you know lifetimes that are that are just healthy and um, uh, prepared for you know whatever it is that they'll experience. So yeah, that's that's my hope. <laughs> I'll think about it. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, so I'm Jess, once again, thank you for that question. Um, it's just terrifying <laughs> of a prospect <laughs> it is. Um, so yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot lately with graduation coming up, and I have, <laughs> I just have joked with my parents a lot of, um, 
you know, I don't know what use there is for an environmental studies and philosophy especially degree with like how focused I am uh, that's not law or something related to that. And I am very interested in these legal questions and uh, especially questions of justice. Um, but I don't know if I absolutely like want to operate within that legal framework. So I'm interested very much as you could see like in the presentation in conflict resolution grew up around conflict and grew up trying to like think around conflict and just kind of always asking my like asking myself how can we all get along um, and with climate change increasing in in you know my lifetime I think there's going to be a lot more conflicts over resources especially over watersheds and water resources and so I do want to be focusing my efforts in perhaps like conflict resolution professionally and looking into uh, different international issues, specifically in Latin America. I'm Cuban and Puerto Rican, and I would really love to reconnect uh, with that part of my culture as well um, and, my, and my heritage. So I'd like to see myself perhaps doing some type of conflict resolution work in Latin America um, or something similar to that. Um. Honestly, this question gets brought up every, I don't know, couple of months. And um, had you asked me a year ago, had you asked me honestly six months ago, it was very different than um, how I want to go about my 10-year plan, sort of say now. But um, I think my foundation to what I want to do in my career, um, again, goes back to advocacy and um, giving back to a community of advocacy that you know advocated for me and my family to get to the point where I am. Um, so it revolves around, again, justice as well and um, legislature, I would say, as well. Um, at one point, I did want to go to law school. That has changed. Um, <laughs> um, and I, it's because I think that there's an aspect of law school that I am not fully wanting to commit to. Um, so. I still do want to do grad school. Um, I am also taking a year off as well and then going back in and applying um, to sociology programs. Um, and yeah, I, I think it would be around grassroots organizing and be around um, advocacy at the state level, um, legislature meetings, um, things around that sort. Greetings, my name is Paul Thompson. I'm a longtime City Club member and thank you for being with us today. Presumably you're, I'm a great student of the scientific method and presumably your research followed that path and so on and therefore there's a chance that you had some surprises along the way. So perhaps you could comment about places where you got unexpected results, you had to fall back and regroup or anything like that that would give us an insight uh, into the uh, methodology that you use. That has been a long road, so <laughs> buckle in. Um, the methodology has changed a lot. I just knew going in that I wanted to somehow tie what I was doing in philosophy with hermeneutics and phenomenology and this like studying of meaning and apply it to how we like form these connections to place in that environmental science and environmental studies uh, sphere of, of things and disciplines. And so I was kind of made my own method and my own methodology within, um, within these two disciplines and combining them. And a lot of my methodology and my method has been influenced by also studying closely the EPES framework that I mentioned in my presentation. Um, and what EPES has done is outlined how values can be brought in and um, integrated into these, these global and local policy setting uh, practices. And so they provide a really helpful framework for categorizing these values. But then, you know, the, the, pho the phenomenologist in me is like, well, you can't reduce things to a category. So it's been like this, this tug of war of wanting to be able to specify how these values are occurring and also not wanting to reduce anything um, or uh, make any reductions. So that's been a delicate balance, but I think with combining uh, the EPAS categorization with 
this like interpretive framework that I've developed using philosophy, I've kind of found a happy medium finally, but it was uh, initially like a lot of uh, just hitting the books and trying to see like what what values were being expressed and then I settled into the policy documents and thinking that that would be a better way to go about it. Um, and I actually use a qualitative coding software now, which I wasn't before, and it's much more efficient. So um, that's kind of where the, where the method is developed out of, was from these very broad um, questions about meaning and being and life, and then bringing it into an actual like more scientific process using the, the framework that's provided by IPES and um, my own understanding and spin on hermeneutic phenomenology in an environmental context. Um, I would say that um, initially starting off, I had no, I guess, clear pathway as to how I wanted to address this question because it's so massive and because it impacts a lot of the U.S. Um, from coast to coast. Um, and I thought through, you know, media and my consumption of media, I looked at the Midwest specifically at the beginning. Um, and I was like, I, in my head, it would make sense that these rates would be higher. Um, but, you know, to my surprise, um, and, and ob honestly, sadness as well, it's like a lot of these higher missing rates were in these bigger cities, um, Seattle, San Francisco, um, San Jose, a lot of these bigger inner cities that you would expect there to be um, a lot more urgency and a lot more attention because these populations, um, you know, contribute to the community and the goodness of the community and all of those things. Um, but I think initially, um, starting off like that, I, I also had trouble, you know, um, wanting to contribute theory within it and um, wanting to contribute how other forms of activism and other forms of identity groups play into this. Like I said, it is all intricately tied together. Um, so, you know, going back into my classes, because my classes are my major specifically, women and gender studies, so it's exactly um, a pretty big topic within that um, uh, major. So, you know, I was going back and rereading all of my assigned um, uh, texts and um, finding exactly how I can incorporate that without also um, taking away from, you know, the main purpose or the main target group of who I'm studying. So um, I would say that I have become uh, pretty well versed in failure with my experiments. <laughs> um, <laughs> What I presented today was, uh, you know, um, a, a pretty easy, or I should say, clear path from how I got to question to answer. But that's obviously been crafted through, you know, a lot of uh, different experiments um, and, and time put into it. Um, so I, I would say that there's sort of two um, answers for myself. The first answer is that um, we have certainly come across points of time where our hypothesis was simply wrong, um, and that's okay because that's what science is about. Um, and what we've done in response to that is we see what, uh, what the science is telling us um, or what we're, you know, what we're figuring out, and um, we simply readjust how we think about it um, and just try and proceed from there because that's really all that, all that we can do. Um, the second side of things is when we get a result that doesn't fit our hypothesis because I've made a mistake, <laughs> um, not because the science is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> And so that's actually something um, that I've had to uh, just like as an individual come to understand and um, appreciate is that uh, I will make mistakes and that I have to be patient and that, um, you know, uh, things aren't always going to go perfectly. Um, so, yeah, it, it's it, you become well versed in failure in science, <laughs> but then that makes the success that much more rewarding. So. Andrew Callick, City Club. I have a question for, for you, Jess, about the applicability of your research to all sorts of very hot questions, uh, especially in the American West right now. We've hit, been in a drought, a millennial drought. Um, there are huge questions about who is going to get what little water we have left. Those questions are rooted in history and culture and all sorts of things. And they are difficult and challenging questions to answer. And I'm wondering what concrete advice you would have uh, for all of us in community 
uh, in terms of how to best go about making those hard choices and talking about them collectively? That's a really fantastic question and something that I find especially attractive in the Nisqually case study. Um, because there are a lot of studies, more, more, more than not, of unsuccessful collaborative processes, unsuccessful mediations, and people unable to set aside differences and come to the table and come up with a, a decision that would satisfy every stakeholder. It is a really hard thing to do, and that's a big reason why I'm doing this research, because it's so important, but so difficult. Um, and I'd like to kind of, I always hearken back to Billy Frank Jr., who is an Esqually tribal leader, and he just has some beautiful and well, well said um, things that he has said over the years about uh, coming into like these processes with a conciliatory attitude. And, you know, I think it's a difficult line to walk, especially with issues of justice and marginalized identities and groups, uh, people who have been dispossessed of their lands, uh, oftentimes in very violent ways to just ask them to come to the table and, and talk to industry interests, talk to governmental interests, and ask them to set aside that pain and you know the fear of, of losing your home and, and things that you care about. Um, it's not easy and not everyone's going to be ready to, to do that. Um, so that's the first thing that you have to understand is that it is a timing thing, it's a healing thing, it's a deeply emotional question that you're asking and it's very psychological. Um, but that being said, a lot of it is just about coming to people in, in community, understanding that you share share these resources and share and share the watershed. For an example, uh, with these other people, for better or for worse, you know, it's it's the context that you're dealing with, and so it's about being adaptive. So much about our response to climate change and to resource use is about adaptability, and so. That's a, that's a sign of resilience, is being able to set aside these differences or set aside these, not set aside, but perhaps hold them at the center. Um, and once like people understand where the other is coming from, then you can go about where you're going forward together. Um, and so it really requires a complex understanding of, of the emotions that are entrenched within these histories. Um, and so it, it's very much like an educational project. And I think that's what the Nisqually uh, has done really well and its watershed with um, you know, the National Park being a huge help and the National Wildlife Refuge and all these different projects that are, are pedagogically based where they're trying to educate people in the watershed about all these different identities that rely on the watershed um, and all these different resources that people depend on within it. And so I think education is a huge one. Um, and I also think uh, the planning process itself, as I emphasized a lot in the presentation and as IFAS um, pushes for, is really, really important and just making sure that you are extending out at the very least the invitation for people to come to the table and talk because a lot of it too has been historically people aren't being invited to come to that deliberative process. And so it's making sure you're reaching out to every single person, you're being as comprehensive as possible, not every single person, every single group um, or representative. Um, and that's a huge part of it is making sure that um, all of those processes are being done as thoroughly as possible, even though it's not the cheapest, it's not the most efficient way to get things done, but it's the best way to get things done. So, yeah. Another question from me. This is for you, Perusa. Uh, you mentioned how one of, one of the findings uh, that you had was that the sort of differential treatment was in some way rooted in our history, both mm -hmm. purely American history and also the, the way that the continent was, was colonized. Um, what's past is past, that will not change. So how do you, given that that past is past, how do you in the present moment try to shift people's understanding uh, of how to treat these cases and make it more equitable? What, what can we do both individually and collectively to achieve that, that goal? Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, and I think right now, um, one of the major reasons why I brought up history um, is that you know everything now is an extension, I would say, of the foundation of this nation. And you know, it's not it's not a matter of you know the histories in the past. It's um, you know we're in like 
I, I understand, obviously, the question, but it's, <sighs> let me put this into words. We need to understand that the way that people got to where they are right now is not, you know, just like by chance. It's a step-by-step -step process. And, um, and like Jess was saying, it's one way that we can go from this position on is by um, bringing them to the table. Um, and on top of that, I was saying earlier, um, consistency. Um, it's, I, I will go back to um, 2020 and, you know, these um, protests that we were having regarding Black Lives Matter, regarding um, police brutality and that lack, I wouldn't say lack of consistency because there were so many consistent efforts up until that point that got us that push and that got us that fuel to drive that summer. But since then, it just has died down and, um, that lack of consistency, again, within social media, there, e there are these trends, there are these ups and downs with um, what gets attention. And I think that's like the major problem and why I even highlighted social media to begin with. But it's the consistency in addressing these um, numbers and addressing these categories of people, as well as the basic is listening um, and there are, I would say there are always two types of listening. There's listening to respond and there's listening to understand and understanding. And I think that's the basics of you know what we can do. And I would say on the, I guess the institutional level, again, it's the education portion. Um, right now there is a pull for the lack of education in certain things. Um, and I think that that's just absolutely so dangerous. Um, and it's not a matter of, you know, pointing fingers. It's a matter of we need to recognize these histories in order to have a uh, plan of action, in order to have aid, in order to recognize the suffering of these individuals and have a solution for them that will inevitably help all of us um, better our community, better our nation um, for us and for those who come after us as well. A perfect point to end on. Thank you very much. This has been our March 3rd, 2023 conversation at the City Club of Eugene. UO undergraduate researchers solving the mysteries of fruit flies, missing persons, and ecosystem stewardship. Before we thank our speakers one last time, I'd like to recognize our diamond sponsors. Kaiser Permanente exists to provide high quality, affordable health care services and to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. More information is available at www.kp.org. The University of Oregon has helped Oregonians question critically, think logically, reason effectively, communicate clearly, act creatively, and live ethically since 1876, as our speakers can show today. Get more information at uoregon.edu. Peace Health has been proud to serve Eugene, Lane County, and beyond as your hometown healthcare provider for more than 80 years. The Peace Health mission is to keep you and your family healthy. Learn more at peacehealth.org. Lane Community College transforms lives through learning. LCC provides comprehensive, accessible, high quality educational opportunities that promote student success. For more information, visit lanecc.edu. And thank you to the City of Eugene and Lane County for their support. Next week on Friday, March 10th, join us again here at the 5th Street Market District as City Club welcomes Rabbi Meyer Goldstein, Rabbi Yitzhak Husbands Hankin, and the FBI Supervisory Special Agent Ryan Dwyer for a urgent program on anti-Semitism and how to fight it. This program engages all two current events related to anti-Semitic bias and harm right here in our community, and we hope you will join us. We also invite you to become a City Club member, sponsor, or to suggest a program of your own at our website, cityclubofeugene.org. We welcome everyone to join the conversation. Thank you all for joining us at the City Club of Eugene. One more round of applause today for our fantastic guests from, from the University of Oregon. Take care and see you next week. <laughs>